comes to the Prime Minister, question number one, Mr. Alan Hazelhurst. Number one. Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, Order. this morning I had a number of meetings and after my duties in this House, I shall continue to reply to some of the 30,000 letters that have so far been delivered to Downing Street in the last few days. Alan Hazelhurst. Mr. Speaker, sir, if, if this is to be the last occasion on which my right honourable friend answers questions from that dispatch box, may I express the appreciation of this side of the House and hopefully the whole House. <laughs> for the skill, command and courtesy with which she has dealt with questions over the last 11 years from that dispatch box. Yeah. Mr Speaker, can I ask my, ask my honourable friend if she is aware that Stansted Airport's new terminal is to open in March of next year and the main road serving it will not be available until 1995 and the rail link serving it will not be of adequate capacity until that same year. Would she agree that if we are to get more public acceptance for amongst communities which have major developments thrust upon them, it would be better for essential infrastructure to come sooner rather than later? Mr Speaker, I am grateful to my honourable friend for his kind words. With regard to Stansted, it is of course close to the M11 and I understand that the British Airports Authority is building a dual carriageway road to connect the new terminal to the M11 and that that should be ready by March next year. And also I understand that British Railway has, is building a track to connect the terminal to the Liverpool Street Station and has already ordered rolling stock and that too should be ready by March next year. Next year, so I hope that will satisfy the last question to my honourable friend that I shall answer. Mr. Neil Killock, Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Killock. Mr. Speaker, would the Prime Minister be good enough to tell us? Which of the policies that she leaves to her successor she now thinks should be scrapped? I am happy that my successor will carry on the excellent policies that in fact have finished with the decline of socialism and have brought great prosperity to this country, which have raised Britain's standing in the world and in fact have brought about a truly capital-owning democracy. But Mr Speaker, if the Prime Minister thinks that nothing should be changed, can she tell us why on earth all of those now competing for her job are desperately wriggling around trying to find a way out of the poll tax trap? On the contrary, I really rather thought that they were keeping the poll community charge. Community charge of... The community charge of... Oh. The closet, and, whatever, and whatever review they have, the result will be infinitely better than going back to the rates, which of course will be the worst of all worlds. May I, may I, Mr. Speaker, may I, Mr. Speaker, since this uh, could conceivably be the last time that the Prime Minister answers, uh, say, to her, say to her that her honest approach on the poll tax is commendable, because she's demonstrating that there are two and only two honest approaches. One is to keep the poll tax intact, as she wants. The other one is to abolish it entirely, as we will do. No, Mr Speaker, that is not correct. As with any new tax, as with any new tax, one always both reviews it and continually amends it. I would have thought the Right Honourable General would have known that no, after this time. Dame Joe Knight. Mr Speaker, may I voice the... May I voice the profound regret of millions in this country and thousands of millions outside it that my right honourable friend is not to continue in her high office and ask, and, and ask, and ask if she is aware of their acknowledgement for her unrivaled service in turning back the tide of socialism, in ending, 
in ending the brutal tyranny of the militants in the trade unions and in re-establishing Britain as a great power. And finally, can I ask her to reflect? And finally, Mr. Speaker. Order, order. The Honourable Lady is coming to an end. Come on, this is that a thousand years from now, when everyone else in this house touches dead dust, she alone will have her hallowed name in the history of yeah. the world. Mr. Speaker, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for her generous tribute. I am certain that the conservative, constructive policies will continue and that they will lead to a fourth election victory. Yeah. Mr. Jim Molyneux! Does the, does the Prime Minister recall an important debate in November 1985 when relations between us were a little strained? Does she recall that I used these words addressing her in that debate? Millions of our fellow British citizens throughout this nation feel that the Prime Minister has a lasting contribution to make to the destiny of this nation. Is the Prime Minister now aware that the vast majority of those people would wish that contribution to continue? Yeah. 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 The right honourable gentleman. The right honourable gentleman is very generous indeed. I think they will continue from the back benches as they have continued from the front benches. This is Maureen Hicks. Is my right honourable friend aware the bank manager, that it was as a result of her unique vision at the helm that the voters in my constituency, after 40 years, rejected Labour? In her words, rejecting windy rhetoric from the general opposite and they rejected her because they saw in her unique qualities and leadership. Can I please take this opportunity on behalf of my constituents to feel a tremendous sense of loss of conveying my very sincere wishes and extending a very warm, a very warm invitation to Dennis and herself to come and see us at Palmer at any time. Mr. Speaker, now I thank my honourable friend very much. I think our policies since 1979 have built a new opportunity Britain which can hold its head high in the world of international affairs and I'm sure those policies will continue and we shall all pull together to ensure that they do. Mrs. Rosie Barnes! Order! All right, all right, all right. That's very impertinent of the Honourable Gentleman. It's Alice Mann. I refer the Honourable Lady to the reply which I gave some moments ago. Alice Mann. Prime, does the Prime Minister agree with her friend, the Honourable Member for Sirencester and Tewkesbury, when he said in the debate last Thursday that her forced resignation had been brought about by an act of treachery by, on the behalf of some of her colleagues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I have resigned and there will soon be a successor. I wish him well. I am sure he will continue the policies which have been so successful, been so successful for Britain and he will continue to defeat socialism. Mr. Thompson! Will my honourable friend, right honourable friend, come very soon to Calder Valley, where she will find, where she will find an industrious, prosperous and happy community, and they will say to, me, to her what they've said to me all weekend, she's been a good un. <laughs> I think after that I must go to Calder Valley. I should look forward to it. This is Rosie Barnes. Number four, number four, sir. I refer the honourable lady to the reply which I gave some moments ago. First of all, may I pay a warm tribute to the Prime Minister for her courage and dignity. 
over recent days. Given that the leadership of the Tory party may be decided by a third ballot using a system of transferable second preference votes, would the Prime Minister not reconsider the merits of this system for national elections? I'm sure the Honourable Lady will understand that I'm all for first past the post. <laughs> David Wilson! Number five. Number five, sir. <laughs> I defer my honourable friend to reply what I gave some moments ago. Job! <laughs> Mr. Speaker, is this could well be one of the last tabled questions from a Conservative to my right honourable friend. Could I take this opportunity to ask her whether she knows how many questions she's answered in her capacity as Prime Minister? Could I ask her to accept the heartfelt thanks of all her many friends inside this House and outside, especially all those in my constituency of Spelthorne? And could I say to her and to Dennis, every good wish for the future and God bless. Mr Speaker, first, this will be the last question time where I shall answer. I don't believe in making a career of positively last appearances. May I thank, uh, may I thank my honourable friend for the kind words, especially uh, about my husband, and thank him also for giving me notice about the question because I might not have known the answer. <laughs> it is, his is the 7,498th oral question that I have replied to in 698 question time. David Winnick, six up. I refer the honourable gentleman to reply which I gave some moments ago. Winnick, but doesn't, Mr Speaker, doesn't the Prime Minister find it at all nauseating and hypocritical yeah. to be so much... <laughs> Come along, Prime Minister, finding the height of hypocrisy and denunciating to be so much praised by Tory MPs when last week 152 of them stabbed her in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, really, the Honourable Member wasn't exactly complimentary on my last appearance, was he? No, I don't find it nauseating. I find it very refreshing. Oh. Mr. Maxwell Heslop! Will my right honourable friend, while she is still Prime Minister, write and leave signed by her a minute of the proceedings of the heads of government within the EEC so that her successor can endeavour to protect Britain's long-term interests in the valiant and effective manner that she has always done? Yeah. I can assure my honourable friend that all the proceedings are very well minuted and documented and I most earnestly hope that the traditions of this House, which is the oldest democracy and the oldest parliament in the community, will be fully upheld because they ensure accountability to the people. Yeah. Mr Kevin Strang, number seven, sir. I refer the honourable gentleman to the reply which I gave some moments ago. Kevin Strang. When the Prime Minister recalls the day she quoted St Francis of Assisi on the steps of Downing Street, will she contemplate the increase in family poverty that resulted from her repeated refusal to increase child benefits? Will she recall the increased hardship which resulted from the 1988 Social Security changes? Will she think about the homeless who have doubled since she came to power? Yeah. Is she aware that we on this side represent communities, some of which have still not recovered from the unprecedented rates of unemployment she inflicted on them in the early 80s? Yeah. Are these some of the reasons why she'll go down in history as the Prime Minister who rewarded the rich and punished the poor? Yeah. Perhaps the Honourable Gentleman will also recall that Scotland is enjoying greater prosperity than she has ever known under any previous government, 
but he also recalled that there are now two million more jobs than there were when I took over. And will he also recall, remembering that occasion when I went in in 1979, that there is much more peace in the coal industry now than there was then, and that this year, this year we have had much more peace in the coal industry, and that we fought off some of the most difficult and vicious attacks during the coal strike that this country has ever seen, and that this year we have had the lowest number of strikes since the whole of the post-war period. Yeah.